Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Island Baptist Church's service for November 29th, 2020. I'm glad that you have tuned in and that you're able to join the service in this way. Of course, I'm a little bit sad and brokenhearted that we are having to go back online, hopefully for just this Sunday, but perhaps for a few Sundays, because as many of you know, in Hong Kong, we've been seeing a big uptick in the number of coronavirus cases that are here. And so what's happened is the place we've been renting uh, temporarily, Playground.Work in Shangwan, they had let us know that sadly they were not going to be able to allow us to come and use their venue on this Sunday. So I've recorded this message for you, and I hope it'll be a blessing to your heart. But let me give you a little bit of an update about how our building project is going and hopefully about what this uh, last month of the year holds for us. So praise the Lord, uh, Pastor Matt and I were able to help get our items moved into the new building at Kingdom Power on the second floor on DeVoe Road. And we'll tell you more about this next week, but if everything goes well with the renovation, the uh, outfitting of the space, and also us getting all of our things in place, Lord willing, we will be able to be in our own building at Kingdom Power next Sunday. That would be in December, first Sunday of December. Now, that being said, we are all keeping our eyes on the coronavirus situation here in Hong Kong. Uh, if you're listening from other parts of the world, you may have seen that we had done very well. We had returned back to services, but now we've got a big uh, uptick as well. So this is a good reason for us to be praying, not only for the safety of those around us in the community, for those who have gotten the virus, for their quick healing and recovery, but also that the Lord would be pleased to allow us to get back together again, face to face, person to person. And like I said, I will let you know all about that. But a special thanks to the PAB with their help on this big move, to Sister Tina as she was arranging a lot of things, Pastor James Ewan, and especially Pastor Matt Herbster as they really helped with the setup for the building. Let's go ahead now and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time we have together. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift and the wonder of technology these days. We thank you when we think about the viral situation and health needs that you've allowed uh, men and women to serve you and uh, to even serve with wisdom that you've given them in medicine with technology. And Father, we thank you also for technology that allows us to stay in touch with each other around the world and even when we have to make changes like we've done this Sunday. Father, we ask that you would help us to be users of these things and not to abuse them. We ask that you would help us, Lord, not to place our faith or our confidence in human wisdom or technology, but Father, that we would use them to realize what great things you have done in us and our minds and our hearts. And Father, we ask that you would allow us to use this time together, even digitally and electronically, to focus on your word today, to be changed in our hearts as we hear what you have for us. Father, even for us to be uplifted as we listen to some music. And Father, we ask that you would help us to just please you in all that we do in the way we use this technology. Lord, we do pray for those who are suffering uh, from illness, Lord, whether it be coronavirus or other uh, besetting illnesses. Lord, we ask that you would raise them up to health, if it would be your will, that you would heal them. And Father, for those in our church family, that you would bring them back to good health. But Father, we also ask especially that you would allow coronavirus, Lord, to be ceasing, for it to be going away. Uh, Father, you've taught us many things through this time of suffering and challenge. You've challenged many hearts. And Father, we want to respond to it in the right way. But of course, Father, we desire to return to a time when we can worship you in normalcy. Father, when we can go around. And Father, no matter what, we ask that you would help us to really be using this time that we're challenged by this season and to be growing in ways that we haven't before. But Father, once again, we pray that in your mercy, we'd be able to meet again soon. And Father, you would bless those, especially who are struggling here in this difficult time. Bless us now, we pray in all these ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the things that I want to do today as we start with our service is we want to welcome you. If somehow this is your first time to be watching the videos, uh, you can go back and see some of our live streams that were recorded on our YouTube channel. You can jump into our study of the book of Hebrews, or you can jump into our study of the book of Daniel. And recently, we've been in the book of Philippians. So if you're with us today, go ahead and open your Bibles whether they be on your phone or your actual physical Bible, to the book of Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 2. But before we do that, I'm going to try and see if I can play some music 
from Pastor Herbster. Now, Pastor Herbster is not with me here in the house, but he was so kind as to direct me to one of the uh, songs that he and his brothers had recorded. And so if this works, I'm going to try and switch the slide so that you can hear a song that is really a good message to us as we look at the passage today. And as you'll see in just a moment, the title of the song is May the Lord Find Us Faithful. And we know from many, many experiences in our lives and from the Word of God that the Lord has been faithful to us. And we're going to see today that we are called to be faithful to Him. So if this works out, let's see if we can hear this a music ministry to us in song. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to
Well, amen. I enjoyed that ministry uh, to us in song, and we are trying to be creative with the way that we worship the Lord, and I hope that was encouragement to you. Maybe what you want to do is if you're able to watch this later in the morning, you can go back and rewind that and learn that song. We're so thankful for Pastor Matt and Tiffany, Jonathan and Annie, as they've been helping us with our music ministry and also to learn a lot of new songs. So maybe you can go back and listen to that again. Again, great words to that song and really a great introduction to where we're at today in our lesson because we had seen last time we were together in Philippians the greatest of all examples of faithfulness that we saw in the suffering and humble servant Jesus Christ. Now today's lesson is going to be what I've described as salvation at work. We're going to move from the example of Jesus Christ back to our call to take effort and to work at our Christian life. So the subtitle of the lesson today is Our Obedience in Christian Living. Now, last week we had lifted up Jesus Christ and seen him described, and that's really where we're going to begin today, because when we talk about the idea of an example, the purpose of an example in your life and mine is not just for us to see someone to admire and to praise, which we do, of course, with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the reason we mention him as an example is so that you and I can start to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Now, we understand that Jesus Christ, as a perfect example to us, is perfect in his sinlessness. He's perfect in his obedience to the Father. And so because of those things, it means we're never going to be able to be exactly like he was in his life. But what we're going to find out today is God has equipped us and enabled us to live a life that's pleasing to him. And today we're going to see a great way that we can begin to live pleasing to him. Now, as we begin, as I said, I want us to go back to this description of Jesus Christ. I mentioned this last week. If you've seen the, the message or if you attended there at Playground.Work, when we talked about Jesus Christ and his mindset, we have to go back to this passage describing Jesus Christ, this great set of verses that I'm going to read to you once more. I'd like for you to follow along with me. I'm going to read from verse 5 to verse 11. We covered this last week, but it's so magnificent and powerful and such a great explanation of who Jesus is and what he's done. We're going to read it again. So Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is where we finished our reading last week, with Jesus' ultimate act of humiliation and obedience, that he even came to suffer and die on the cross for sinners like you and like me. We'd said last week as well, when this begins, it begins with Jesus Christ and his glory in heaven. And it ends here, we would say, it seems at the cross, but it actually doesn't in there because look down at verse nine. It says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So as we finish these verses here, we're going to see the, the conclusion, we could say, or culmination of what we had talked about last week, where we see Christ's reward for his humiliation in coming to offer salvation to you and me. Now, the way I've arranged this, as I said I was going to do last week, is I'm going to show you once more, how the Bible describes here, Paul, through inspiration by the Holy Spirit, shows us the depths to which Jesus Christ was humbled, and now it's going to show us this week the extent to which Jesus Christ was exalted. So I think this will be clear as you look on the screen. It says in this passage, first of all, as we've discussed already, that Jesus Christ was in the form of God. Now, this phrase, in the form of God, it's not just talking about appearance. When we use this word form at the time of Paul's writings and really through the history of the use of the word, this word form was an outward expression of the, inter, of the inside truth, of the inner truth. 
So this description of Jesus Christ was saying that he wasn't uh, less than God, but that he was indeed God, that he was manifested as God, that this was his position of honor and glory with God. And yet, despite of this, we find out that he was humbled. We talked about last week how not only did Jesus Christ not have to try or, or, or seek and grasp at being God, but he relinquished these great honors when he came in humility. Even though he was still the Son of God, God the Son, we understand, we see his humiliation here. So Christ, being in the form of God, made himself of no reputation. He could have had all the glory that he had with the Father, and yet he came to be born in a manger. He took upon him the form of a servant. Not only was he born, but he was born in lowly and mean estate. And then he was made in the likeness of men. This is the incarnation, Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. You'll remember that I had shared when we were in the book of Daniel, how those soothsayers and the fortune tellers had said in exasperation but probably many religious people through the ages have said in great sadness that the gods do not dwell on earth with mankind. Now, that's what they thought in their pagan mindset. But the wonder of wonders in the incarnation of Jesus Christ is that the creator came to dwell among the creation and took upon him the likeness of men. What an astonishing reversal we see there. And then it says he humbled himself. He became obedient unto death. And not only the death of a normal life, but he was obedient unto the death of the cross. Now, we Christians understand the significance of the cross. We understand that as Isaiah had prophesied, the Lord Jesus Christ was coming to be humbled, yes, but to take your sins and my sins upon him, to bear them in himself on his body to the tree. He took that great cup of wrath, the cup of trembling. He took our sins and he took and bore our punishment so that we could be forgiven, so that our sins could be washed away by his blood. And friends, if you're listening today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, perhaps you admire him. Perhaps you think he was a great man or a wonderful teacher, but I want to remind you, he came from the realms of glory to the earth, not just to be a beautiful baby in a manger that we celebrate at Christmas time, but he came specifically to die on the cross for you and for me. And I want you to realize today that Jesus Christ died for you. The Bible says clearly, God loves you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And if you'll trust him today to be your savior, if you'll confess your sins to him and confess him as Lord, trust him for the forgiveness of your sins, you can be saved today. Now, I also wanna say, as we talk, talk now about Jesus Christ coming to die on the cross, we're gonna see as well that God exalted him because of what he did. As it says here in the passage, wherefore, you'll notice that, wherefore in verse nine, God hath highly exalted him. The exaltation of Jesus Christ began as Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. He did not stay in the tomb. He had power over the grave and he rose victorious. In fact, Paul begins in Romans chapter one by saying this was a testimony and a certification that Jesus Christ was not just the Messiah, the son of David, but that he was the true son of God risen from the dead. God has highly exalted him. He has given him a name above every name. There is only one son of God. There is only one Messiah. There's only one redeemer. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's no other name given under heaven whereby men and women are to be saved, but by the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, friends, if you want to know God, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to have forgiveness of your sins and eternal life in you, freedom from fear and the bondage and the, the, the worry and the terror of death, then you need to trust the name of Jesus Christ and be saved today. You know, all around the world, people are scared and worried about many things, perhaps because of the coronavirus, some are scared. But you know what, friends, if you will trust Jesus Christ today, if you will bow the knee to this great name, you can have the forgiveness of your sins, the promise of eternal life, and you don't have to live in fear. God exalted Jesus Christ. He's given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee 
should bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you look down back at your Bibles, this verse 11, it says it is going to happen. Verse 10 says it's going to happen to everyone. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, whether living or dead, whether angels or humans, whether the saved or the lost, everyone is going to have to recognize and declare that Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, I've said this many times if you've attended our church or listened to the services. If you're listening to the messages and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, let me say it this way. You can bow the knee to Jesus Christ today. You can come to him, admit your sins to him and ask for forgiveness and humble yourself and say, I am guilty before God. I need a savior. If you'll bow the knee now, then whenever Jesus Christ returns again, and when Jesus Christ is fully glorified to the whole universe, then you'll be on the winning side. You'll be with Jesus Christ. But friends, if you're stubborn and you're rebellious and we're rejecting Jesus Christ and you say, I'm not going to bow to him. I don't need a savior. Well, friends, I've got bad news for you. You will bow the knee someday. And at that time, it's going to be eternally too late for you to be saved. So bow the knee today before it is too late. Christian friends, what a joy it is for you and me to remember that we trusted in Jesus Christ. And when we see him exalted someday, we see him high and lifted up that we belong to him and we're on the victorious side. But Christians, I want to challenge you about this. If Jesus Christ is Lord and you've confessed him to be so, and you said you bowed the knees, let me ask you this. Are you bowing the knee to the Lord today in the way you lived your life? Or sadly, are you treating the Lord blasphemously as some type of eternal safety mechanism, some type of eternal fire insurance to where you say, well, I'm saved, I'm safe, and now I can just live my life. No, friends, you've got the wrong idea. Paul says, wherefore, in this passage in verse 9, but if you look in your Bibles, he says in verse 12 again, because of all that's gone before, Wherefore, now you and I are supposed to live a different kind of life because you and I are supposed to have the same mindset that Jesus Christ had. Let me go back to that slide one more time before we see this. When we talk about Jesus Christ and who he is, this example of his humiliation and exaltation, there's a couple of things that I want to say about it. First of all is this. It shows us who our Lord Jesus Christ is. He's our Savior. He suffered and died for us, but he is God himself. Then secondly, we get to see that this is how God works. This is how God will honor his son, Jesus Christ, but also honors you and me. You see, God desires for us to be meek and to be humble. The man and the woman, the the men and women who are humble and meek, those who are lowly and desire to serve, those are the ones that God desires to exalt. I read this verse before. I'll read it again. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Christian friends, we know Jesus Christ humbled himself more than anyone possibly could. There's only one who could come from being God himself to dying on the, the death of that wicked and cruel cross. But you know what, friends? We ought to imitate Jesus Christ in humbling ourselves and allowing God to lift us up. Christian friends, it should never be named once among us that we are pursuing our own vain glory and we are pursuing envy and strife, as we've already read about. We ought to humble ourselves, serve the Lord, and allow him to be the one to let us uh, be lifted up in our in their own good time. And like I said last week, what a wonderful thing someday to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, since this is true, now we say, well, wherefore all that's gone before because of the example of Christ, because of the challenge of the apostle Paul, how are we supposed to live? Well, let's begin to look at the Christian's responsibility. And again, the entirety of this book is going to continue to teach us Christian responsibility but I'm going to share with you a few examples from uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through verse 18. As we look at this, let's read verses 12 through 13. Paul says, Wherefore, because of all that's gone before, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, as this begins, the way I describe it is concerned action. You and I as Christians realize that we should care about how we live, that we're not going through life flippantly and foolishly and lazily, but that we care about how we live. And and verse 12 might surprise some of you because the apostle Paul begs them and says, hey, listen, you did a wonderful job when I was there with you, but do even better now that I'm gone. What I want you to do is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, let me say a few things about this. Uh, Obviously, those of you who attend Island Baptist Church know that we do not work to save ourselves. The work has been finished by Jesus Christ on the cross. When he died on the cross, one of his last phrases was, he says, it is finished. That great work of sacrifice and salvation had been accomplished. The Bible says that you and I are not the ones that save ourselves. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, that's not our works, by his gracious gift, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you say, well, pastor, what do you mean? What does Paul mean? And what does the Holy Spirit mean here in verse 12 of Philippians chapter two about working out our own salvation? This working out here is that you and I are supposed to complete. We're supposed to fulfill. We are supposed to be participating in the working out of our salvation in our lives. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior for the forgiveness of your sins, then you're saved. But all that that means and all that that should look like in your life and all that it should be accomplishing, that is to be worked out in your life. It's supposed to be accomplished, and God expects you to do it. He expects you to be active in participation. I'm going to clarify this in just a few minutes at verse 13, but I want to let it sink in. God is saying you've got the responsibility to do it. Let's focus on this for a moment. First of all, we see it's an obedient act. You Christians have the duty to obey the commands God has given to you. You've got the duty to avoid the things God has said not to do. But Paul says here in verse 12, he describes it as obedience. You have always obeyed. Now, really, Paul would be saying you've obeyed the words that I've written to you by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. But more importantly, you have obeyed God. If you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, the way the world sees it, the way we see it, and the way God sees your faith is through your obedience. This is what the apostle James was trying to say. The the half-brother of Jesus Christ was saying that, listen, works need to be present in your life if you truly believe because you need to obey what God has done. Think about the description of Jesus Christ we just read about. As he humbled himself, he became what? He became obedient even unto death. How is it with you and me, Christian friends? Are you obedient? You should be concerned to do it. As well, we want to say this. Paul says, work out your own salvation. It is yours. You have a particular way you're supposed to live for the Lord. If you have a godly father or a godly mother or grandparents or brothers or sisters, praise the Lord for that. But their salvation as it's working out in their lives is going to look differently than yours. God's given you your own personality, your own body, your own uh, unique set of skills that you have naturally. But more than that, if you're a Christian, he's given you a special set of spiritual gifts and giftings. And there's a particular way that you're supposed to live. And it is your duty to work out this common shared salvation in a very peculiar and unique way. We in our church need all the members of the body to be working out all that God has done in them if we're going to be a full and a complete body with Christ as our head. So you personally need to take responsibility. That good or godly mother or father or brother or sister or husband or wife, they can't live it out for you. I can't do it for you. Pastor Matt can't do it for you. You have a responsibility to fulfill what you are called to do. You need to obey and be obedient yourself. 
Don't try and rest on the laurels of someone else or be under the umbrella of someone else's godliness. It's for you to do. Then also, this is serious. If you look at what Paul says, he says to do it with fear and trembling. And you might rightly say, when you listen to this, to say, well, pastor, that just means that it's with reverence, it's with awe of God, and that's absolutely true. But the word here is fear. The word fear, we know it doesn't mean a slavish fear or some kind of just being terrified of God, but it is to understand, as we heard Pastor Matt share so wonderfully on Wednesday nights, that we're supposed to have the fear of the Lord. That's throughout the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord is where we are in awe of God. We have reverence to God, but also we realize that our God is someone to be supremely respected, to have awe and wonder and even terror in his presence. And when we talk about this, we understand who God is as something that's awesome and something that ought to be respected. But also we realize as well that God is able to chasten us. If you're a child of God, he's able to punish and to bring you back to the places that you need to go. You know, Pastor Matt and I were talking about it this week. It's manifestly clear from the Bible that the Bible says God can be disappointed and can be angry and wrathful. If you think about the book of Proverbs, you've heard me preach before, there are ways to make God mad. Now, some of you might get upset and say, but wait a minute, God's not mad at you. He loves you. Now, that's true. And if you're a Christian, God does love you and your standing in Christ is not going to change. But you need to be remembered that the way you live your life, your obedience and disobedience, God does care about. And he is displeased or pleased by the way we live. Not that he's going to cast us out of his care. Not that we're going to be lost and go to hell if we're a Christian. But you need to know you can bring joy to God. You can bring displeasure to God. And the idea of displeasing and a thrice holy God, the creator of the universe, your sovereign Lord, that ought to be a fearful thing. And you ought to be afraid of displeasing and disobeying God. Even to the point, as it says here, this word is, is really like the idea of trembling. Let me ask you this, Christian friends. How seriously do you take your growth in Christ? How seriously do you take your sanctification? How seriously do you take your obedience and pleasing the Lord? Is it something you only think about on a Sunday or a Wednesday night? or whenever you know you're going to get around another Christian. Friends, this is supposed to be the passion of our lives to see the wonderful work of Jesus Christ and his salvation working out in our lives. Now, as we've talked about this, I hope you've noticed that I'm talking about your personal responsibility and mine. Uh, one of the old Greek scholars, Robertson, had talked about this passage and says, you know what, Paul here is talking about, talking as if in verse 12, it all depends on you. But let's look at verse 13, where that commentator says in verse 13, he acts as if it all depends on God. And this is true. Sorry, look down at verse 13. It says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This action, this ability is enabled by the Lord, both to desire it and to do it. Some of you come to church and you're not a Christian. You're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet. And you listen to these messages. You read these passages and you say, this makes no sense to me. I don't have a desire to live that way. Why should I humble myself? You know what your problem is? You don't have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and so God is not working in you to, to desire to do these good things. But Christians, if you're listening, even if you're maybe backslidden, even if you may be a bit cold, even if you've gotten off track, there ought to be something in you who says, God, I desire to do what you want me to do. Oh, Lord, help me. Forgive me. Bring me back to a place of service. Listen, the Lord is in you working both to will and also to do of his good pleasure. That should encourage you Christians because maybe you say, I can't do it. It's too hard for me. My flesh is too weak. And you're absolutely right. It is too hard for you. But friends, God has equipped you and enabled you to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. God works in you. The, the word here is this word of energizing work. Uh, Warren Wearsby comments on this passage and says there's at least three ways that are mentioned that God is working in you in this same kind of word. First of all, we'd say it's the word of God. As you study and apply the word of God, you 
you meditate on it, you memorize it, God works through his word to purify, to cleanse, to lead you, many other things. He also works in prayer. We said this in a mysterious way from when Paul was talking in Philippians chapter two, God is pleased to work through the prayers of his people and to work in you. And then lastly, God also will work in suffering. We're going to see that even in Philippians. God's able to accomplish things in your life. Now, that's just a few, but here's what I want to say. Verse 12 is saying, act and work as if it's all depending on you. Verse 13 is saying, have the confidence and know that it's God that is working in you in the first place. Sometimes people are stupefied and stymied at whether or not it's God working or them working, whether it's God doing it or them doing it. Listen, the Lord is the one who is energizing in these ways. James chapter one, I've said many times, says every good and perfect gift is given to us from the Lord. He gets the glory as we work to serve him. But you'll look at these verses again. Verse 14 says not only we should be concerned with how we work and live in our lives, but we should do it with contentment. The actions we take are contented. Verse 14 says very simply, do all things without murmurings and disputings. You think about this already in, these, in this chapter. Verse 3 had said, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Don't do anything through strife. Don't do, do anything through pride. And now it says as well in verse 14, don't do anything with murmurings and disputings. Now, I'm glad that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to put this at the, the end or the heel of verses 12 and 13. Because some of you might say, well, you know what? I can do anything for the Lord. I'll serve the Lord. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do the things that he wants me to. I'll be obedient. And then in the back of your, your throat, you say, but I don't want to do it. I'm not happy about it. I shouldn't have to do this. You gripe and you murmur and you complain and you grumble. These words here, the, the murmuring is really the idea of a grumbling, mumbling, and griping. Disputings is the idea of fighting and arguing. It's like a, a, a dialogue of argument. That might be with other people. That might be with the Lord. It might be within yourself. But your action should not be one full of fussing and fighting with others and grumbling, complaining, and, and wanting to argue about everything. What a blessing it is when someone serves the Lord in a way where they're happy to do it. And I want to say this, friends, as you think about it, your grumbling, your fussing, and your arguing can undercut and destroy the good actions that you might be doing for the Lord. So Paul was begging and saying, don't let this be present in your life. As we go on to the rest of this, verses 15 through 18, we see here, first of all, we make a de declaration in the way that we live. Paul says, if you'll live in this way, then in verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Our testimony, first of all, it's a requirement. If you're going to try to please the Lord and you're going to serve him and you're going to share, you need to have a good testimony. And as well, we see if you do this, if you have a good testimony, there's a wonderful result. So first of all, you and I are called to be blameless, not being able to be accused by anyone because the way we live our life, not doing any harm to anybody, and also not being rebuked to where someone can come to us and say, you're in the wrong, you have sinned, you've, you've violated the law, you have hurt me, you've done those things which are bad. We're supposed to be living a blameless, harmless, and rebukeless life. And the result is if we'll do that, we're able to shine in the darkness more brightly. You look at the bottom of the verse, it says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. You know, the Bible doesn't cut any punches. It says it's a wicked world out there. It's a crooked, crooked and a perverse world. The word perverse means that it turns people to the side to leave the straight and narrow and to go off into sin. It's a wicked and a dark world. But you know what, friends? God spends less time in the New Testament epistles talking about the darkness and the perversion of the world than it does saying you are supposed to live the right way in it. Of course, the world is going to live worldly. Of course, the darkness is going to be dark. But how about you? 
Don't you be dark. Don't you be perverse. Don't you be crooked. Be blameless and harmless and without rebuke. And if you'll do that, you're going to stand out. You're going to shine as lights in the world. You see, God did not call you and me to go hide away on a mountain or in a monastery or hide away. He wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. He wants us to shine the hope of the gospel into this dark world. And friends, if you are not living a Christ-like life, if you're not blameless, harmless, and rebuke, and without rebuke, you're going to not be shining the light like you should. In fact, it'd be better for you to just be hidden away because you're giving a bad testimony to the name of Christ. But I also want to say this as well. When the Bible talks to us about winning the world, it does not talk to us about winning the world by imitation. We win the world by our distinction, that we are different than the world. Yes, humble. Yes, kind. Yes, meek and reverent to the watching world. But we are not imitators of the world. We are imitators of Christ. And that's how we shine in the darkness. Also as well, whenever we testify, you look at verse 16, it says, holding forth the word of life that I, that's Paul, may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. They were the ones who now had the privilege to share the word of life. Remember what Paul said, he was in prison, but he rejoiced to hear that the gospel of Jesus Christ was going forth. In a very small way, I can say as a pastor, I am so thankful and proud, I hope in the right way, and I rejoice when I hear that our church members are sharing the gospel with the lost. When you're getting together with your friends and your coworkers, and I'm not going to mention you by name, but many of you are wonderful soul winners, and you hold forth the word of life. God bless you. That's an encouragement to me. It makes me feel like my small service to you is not in vain. And it also lets me see that the work of God is working out in your hearts. Friends, you are called to share the word of life. You've received it if you're a Christian. Now you've got a chance to share it. That's how we can declare by the way we live. First of all, our testimony, and then how we testify to the truth of the gospel. If your testimony is not there and you try to hold forth a word of life, you're just going to be a hindrance instead of a help to the gospel. As we close this out, there's this declaration in the way we live, but also challengingly, there's dedication in the way we're supposed to live. This is hard. This is something that only God can enable us to do. But look down at verse 17 and 18 to see what Paul says about himself. He says, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. This was an offering, he was saying, almost like a drink offering, a poured out. He's saying, even if I have to die, even if I'm offered and sacrificed in the service of your faith, he says, I would joy and rejoice with you all. He's saying, I am so devoted to the Lord and to serving you in the gospel that I'd even be willing to die. And he says in verse 18, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. He says, I would have joy and I'd rejoice with you. And I desire for you to rejoice and have joy with me because he says, I can be content. I can have joy and happiness even if I die. Why? Because I'd be dying in the service of my Lord. You think about Jesus Christ. His joy was to serve the Father. He came from the realms of glory all the way to this earth that we celebrate at Christmas time. And he did that with joy to serve the Father. He counted what was coming in the return to the Lord, the resurrection, the exaltation, and the honoring of God as worthy for him to make the sacrifice. We've seen this in the book of Hebrews where it says that Jesus Christ was willing to count on what was coming, the joy of serving the Lord, and he was willing to suffer the same, suffer the shame and to die on the cross for you and for me. Paul says the same thing for himself. He says, listen, I'm so dedicated to the Lord that in life or in death, I rejoice to serve him. That's challenging, Christians, isn't it? But for you and for me, we are supposed to take a concerned interest in how we live for the Lord. Remember how Paul began this? He said, wherefore? Here's the way I apply, apply this passage we cover today. When I look at Jesus Christ, who he is, how he humbled himself to came, and came to die on a cross for my sins and for yours, 
How can I not desire to live for him, to serve him, and to love him? So friends, for you and for me today, yes, God says to you, you're saved, but now you need to work that out in your life. You need to start living faithfully for the Lord. That's your Christian responsibility. Yes, God is working in you both to will and to do it, but you need to be obedient and do it. The way you live and the extent of your devotion is going to make an impact in this world, friends. You know what, Christian friends, it is a dark world. It's crooked and perverse. There's a lot of sinfulness in society. There's a lot of fear in society these days. What is your life testifying? We're all interested and concerned about coronavirus and the pandemic, and we want to avoid it. We want to be healthy and happy. But friends, do you have the bedrock of contentment in Christ that you can face a scary sin filled and suffering filled world and still look at people and say, Jesus Christ is a source of my joy. I want to share the gospel with you, talk to you about how you can know the savior. Listen, God is working in you and in me. If you're a Christian and you have the great privilege of working out this salvation that he has brought to your life, he saved us. And now let's show by the way we live our life that we want to honor him and obey him. Let's pray and ask God to help us in all these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for your word today, for how it shows us the example of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did on our behalf. And Father, may we take his example and remember that you have enabled us to serve you and may we live lives that are pleasing to you. Please help us, Father, to do nothing with murmuring and grumbling, Lord. Please help us, Father, to be willing to suffer for you and to do it joyfully. And Father, help us to hold forth the word of life. Help us to shine in the midst of the darkness and help us to be pleasing in your sight. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.